The beauty of Devil Spire is approachability. I know that sounds a little strange, and so I assume clicking on this you have some idea what a dungeon crawler is, and what dungeon crawlers usually entail. Devil Spire does not suffer from the stereotypes of the genre. In fact, the roguelike nature of it gives a fantastic twist that was wildly needed and gives it much approachability to a new audience. At its core, it is based around the ability to, on the fly, experience different play styles and new types of classes, spells, and weapons constantly. You can play six different characters in two hours, not experience a single playthrough that feels the same or a player character who plays the same. You have to build yourself up for 20 hours of grinding. There is no torture of having to deal with a bad build for 15 hours until you find that one right illusionary wall that behind it has that specific ring that you need that will define how you play. No, you choose your portrait, class, basic stats, and go. Let the experience guide you and have fun. It's a flawless style of gameplay, and one that, though it has a bare bones tutorial, trusts you, and if that matter has confidence in itself, lets you play and be guided by dynamic stories and gameplay. Now, I do want to say the Longhorn Burn I mentioned above isn't a negative. It can be frustrating, yes, but I and many others do enjoy it. There's something to be said and commended for games in this genre that attempt something more accessible without sacrificing the complexity. I'm a relative newcomer to the Kingsfield style of game. I've played other From Software games for a while, however. I remember that whenever Demon's Souls was new, I had middle school friends at lunch talking about it. And looking back, they were obviously lying to me. Though those lies did make me buy the game, but Sam, you told me that when you die in Demon's Souls, you dropped all your levels, weapons, and armor and items, and that, that was awesome. That's a lie, Sam! You don't drop everything, you stupid, smug bastard! Only the last year or so did I decide to go back and try Kingsfield proper. I will admit, for full disclosure, the only Kingsfield game I played to completion is Kingsfield 4 The Ancient City. And I would argue that my completing of Eternal Ring counts too. But I've also played a decent bit of Kingsfield-inspired titles, if that matter titles inspired Kingsfield like the Wizardry series, and find I really like this subgenre. And further, upon playing Devil's Spy, I've learned that it's actually no slouch when compared up against them. In terms of accessibility, it's the most accessible dungeon crawler of this style I've ever played. And I'm not exactly sure if that can be conquered or something can do it better. There isn't any other dungeon crawler of this style that I can play and just be like, hey, I'm gonna spend 30 minutes on this. If I'm playing Kingsfield, I'm gonna usually be doing it for several hours, but this I can just spend 10 minutes on, or an hour, or 10. So to be honest, before we get into the review proper, I did get a review copy of this game, though it had been on my wish list for months before then, so it was a pleasant surprise to get. My channel first and foremost is about my own expression, and regardless of a review copy, sponsorship, or whatever else, I'll always be honest with myself and with you, as this is, well, about me. It's kind of a vanity project, honestly, to get across my own thoughts and beliefs. And I assume indie creators that send out review copies of smaller creators like myself want a genuine opinion and not just reiteration of false positivity. With that out of the way, let's continue. When you start Devil Spire, it just throws you in the deep end, and thank goodness for that. No, seriously, I mean it. Sets the precedent the game needs to right away, and that precedent is experimentation. There aren't 15 pop-up windows telling you what every stat is. You aren't told what changing your age and height do, no. You move around the mouse and click where you want to, and learn very quickly what is available to you. Changing classes obviously changes your starting equipment, it tells you that, and your stats have nice little descriptions of them. You also have 40 points to work with. The game starts it off with 10 in every stat, but you can deduct some points from certain skills to increase others. This makes a great risk-reward system without being entirely crippling if you make the wrong decision, but it does help you if you have an idea of what you want to be and get a head start. If you want to play a heavy-hitting berserker, you can probably dump intelligence and boost strength, but also who knows if the RNG gods are going to give you a nice spell on the second floor. Risk-reward is the name of the game. The paper doll head that you make is surprisingly robust in its customization. Lots of different options, starting with skin tones and even different species, going from human to reptilian to feline. The head you make will always be displayed on screen. It's very reminiscent of those classic boomer shooters that show you the health by the head in the corner. Plus it gives some character to your character, with just ambient looking around and expressions. And though it's a small detail, it makes every run just feel that little bit more distinct, and helps make the illusion, and gives you the ability to make your own player characters feel distinct from one another. The height changes your camera position, and weight makes the steps that you make sound louder. And I believe that age just makes the tone of your hair turn grayer. Now for some issues on this paper doll though. Armor you pick up can be slotted on the paper doll, but you'll never see this on a representation of your character either on your displayed head and chest, or on a body in your screen. It's honestly a very minor thing, and it's something that I came to terms with rather quickly. Though in other games like, say, Daggerfall, I did get a lot of enjoyment out of seeing my sprite change with new armor. There wasn't a third-person mode or much reason to have this beyond that initial satisfaction of seeing your character grow. But I also understand this is an indie studio, and the paper doll head plus the little inventory icons already give the illusion of that, without taking up too many resources. Also, as another minor little thing, I think the hair options are very limited. There are only seven, and they're also repeated for the feline, which, um, doesn't fit since it adds a hairline to fur. 
but again, uh, very minor. Though the head is neat and cool, it isn't the end-all be-all of the graphics or gameplay, of course. That's one comment on it a little bit while we're still in the beginning. And to be honest, it gives you more options than I thought it would, especially for a title that on first glance appears to be smaller, but this game is anything but. When you launch the game for the first time, you're put into a tutorial that will only appear once. It is rather simple. It teaches you how to walk, swing weapons, activate items, cast spells, turn on or off your lamp, and etc. It also works as a slow barrier to change your graphic settings, which there are a lot to tweak. When you change something and close the menu, though, there's this white flash that accompanies it. And that's not good. It almost always flashbanged me, and made me want to avoid using the settings menu in the future. A minor comment, but a good one, the majority of controls can be used with a keyboard, and they're actually very good. Control and alter for attacking and blocking, and it feels satisfying. I didn't use it much, but for others watching, prefer a keyboard-only approach, or for those who need accessibility features, or more, or more retro or unique control scheme, it is a very nice feature. The animations are also really good. Swinging weapons feels impactful and strangely realistic with heft and power as well as fluidity to it and its animation. Very satisfying. And the King 2 is great. I love me some Dark Messiah Might and Magic inspired action. It just looks really good and stylized. And I like the floating weapons instead of, the, instead of showing the body and arms as an aesthetic quite a bit actually. Once you finish the tutorial, you're thrown into the game proper, your first dungeon. In this dungeon and all others, you can find written notes on the ground telling you little hints from the point of view of a fellow dungeon delver. These work as an ever-present tutorial that is not intrusive at all, very similar to the messages of the Souls games. It gives hints and tips on how to do things you may not find your own like how to combine and repair items. The combat is simple at first glance, but very good. There are over 24 types of weapons, which give an insane amount of variety, from great swords to short swords to throwing knives to long pistols to crossbows to axes and clubs and everything in between, each with different swings, attacks, speeds, and get this, true dual wielding. If you put a weapon in your offhand, it completely changes your moveset. Chaining an attack with a single sword and nothing else but just a shield does two swings. Add a dagger, and the second attack naturally does a quick jab with it. With throwing knives, slash then throw. With a pistol, slash and shoot. This is ingenious, and it makes it so that rather than 24 types of weapons and movesets, you can multiply that number by quite a bit. You can also choose to block to do a reverse attack from the opposite direction, or use the offhand weapon first. In addition, there are a ton of interactable objects in the environment. Pick up a barrel and toss it at an enemy. Put a crate in front of a trap to take the damage. So many dungeon crawlers make the mistake of the controls and experience being just simply limited to you and your own body, with nothing external implemented except for loot, enemies, traps, and doors. But this has so many things in the environment to ground you to the setting and immerse you, make you feel like you can do anything with the items around you. Enemy movesets are relatively simple, at least for the martial ones. You will learn pretty quickly what they can do and when to dodge or block. This game also prioritizes interrupting your enemies, so being strategic when you hit people to get a slash in or a kick to interrupt an enemy's big attack is much needed and very satisfying. The enemies also aren't as dumb as I expected them to be. They will actually backpedal if they're weaker on the losing side to retreat or recover, or even get a better position to cast a spell or shoot something at you. Likewise, you can even lose enemies by running away and hiding. No ball hacks from enemies who know your every location. Magical enemies and bosses, though, are your biggest hurdle. Magic in this game is very unique and honestly very eldritch feeling. The effects that they cause look out of place, but not in an unintentional way. It's on purpose. Like with every spell you or your enemy casts, you're literally changing reality and shifting dimensions to bring about the effect. Casting yourself is simple. Tap or hold Q and have the effect happen. There are 48 different spells and 60 enchantments. This can be anything, from a simple projectile damage spell to healing to risk reward spell. For instance, one where you heal yourself, but you also heal all their enemies on that floor and paralyze everything, including yourself for a moment. The enchantments are also game changers, like one that makes all of your attacks send out a shockwave. You can even block some spells and even hit them back, which is always very satisfying to pull off. Inevitably, you will die. I died the first boss, as I'm sure most will do. A giant slime creature that makes a terrain it moves over, become acidic, and tries to surround you to deal massive damage. Running inside of it, or allowing it to consume you, will mean a quick, compounding death, which happened to my first guy. I keep mentioning the roguelike nature of this game being its strong suit. Death is not something that ever made me rage in Devil's Spire, not even once, and I was always excited for a new run and a new character. Now I know well that many dungeon crawlers before Devil's Spire have been roguelikes, like the original Baroque, but those roguelikes tended to reset a big amount of progress instantaneously, and you felt the loss keenly. Devil's Spire does not suffer from this, and it lets you keep some form of progression even after death. In this game, it's a total of souls, which you can then use to purchase other game modes. You start off with two unlocked, but there are a total of six, from small dungeons to huge multi-hour affairs to boss rushes to a hundred floor gauntlet. Furthermore, you can tweak settings as you wish, like the game speed. I would recommend sticking to normal for a bit. Likewise, I'd say stick with the default ascent game mode until you clear it or you feel confident in it. But hey, I don't control you. You have free will. Exercise it. No, really. Do it. Right now. Do it. Prove to yourself you're truly free. Go on then. Poke your knee. Or your face. Or don't. 
Either way, you're exercising free will by choosing to do it or not to do it. A choice was made. You see, this is why I think free will absolute is so important. When you die and make a new character and are thrown into what will soon become a familiar site, the starting village, it is simultaneously comforting, haunting, and barren. The buildings that exist all function as storefronts. I would have liked a tavern or a home of some kind, but maybe that would make the game world outside the tower too relaxing and less uninviting. Each of the merchants have a unique personality, from clueless and strange to hopeful and spirited. The items they sell are randomized each playthrough, and you choose to rest here for a bit before committing to the dungeon. There are actually a few different dungeons that you can encounter as your first one, same with the others as you ascend. There are 10 dungeon tile sets in total, and they are randomly generated each time, but they don't feel like they are. They have hidden walls, traps, and other variations within them, like magical wells, locked chests, shrines, and more that feels hand-placed, despite not being so. The first dungeon can either be mossy, overgrown ruins filled with goat men and mushroom people, or a more straightforward, hard stone, blood-filled and torture dungeon, with beefcake minotaurs and warriors. The other tile sets can range from Egyptian desert-themed one, to an underwater one filled with mermen and sirens, to a forest-like labyrinth filled with fae and pixies. In the dungeons, you can find loot from scavenging, smaller things like bones and cast-aside tools, Tools, to finding hidden doors and chests behind them. The finding special cards typically give you a bonus in exchange for a negative. Leveling a boss also just gives you an outright bonus of a stat boost or gold. Leveling up is simple. You hit an XP threshold, add a point or two to your stats, and then quick, easy, and back into the action. Weapons and equipment I would say are the most important, especially enchanted items like rings. Equipment can break, but it can almost always be repaired beforehand if you keep an eye on it. The durability and breaking is frustrating actually, as it leads to constant experimentation. When a good item breaks, it feels like you got your worth out of it, and will miss its absence, which allows for finding powerful items early, then will just carry you throughout the entire game. I wasn't going to give throwing knives a shot, as most games really make them underpowered, but due to weapon breaking I experimented, and found that I absolutely loved using them. This experimentation is a constant boon to the game. Likewise, magic drops are random or bought and they are not guaranteed to be found, so a random spell that you picked up may change your entire playthrough. There are also cursed, enchanted, miscellaneous items, some that your entire playthrough can be based around, like one that heals you but saps all of your magic. Presentation-wise, Devil's Spire already makes a strong first impression on Boot Up. I absolutely love the title screen of the game. Super stylized, like a late PS1 game or a 90s PC dungeon crawler. Great music and a small detail, but I love the dissolving of the letters. It's super cool. That's honestly how I would describe all of Devil Spire's presentation. Small details and cool. So this is going to be just a loose collection of graphical things that I found neat. The lantern mechanic is fantastic, both in the gameplay sense, but also in presentation. It can completely change the mood of zones, fights, and feelings of safety. It's like in a horror game whenever you return to a previous area that was lit up, but now it's shifted, but it's happening in real time. Likewise, the auto map in the top right is very useful, and always visible and easy to read, perfect for retracing steps and trying to identify new possible rooms or hidden doors. When you're in water zones, you can look at the wooden objects like barrels and crates and actually see that they float and change with the height of the water. This amazed me when I saw it. This game just loves small details to make everything feel more substantial and wanted and just... I already said it, but it feels like there's care put into it. Killing enemies leaves behind a gory mess for easy backtracking. The enemy design in general is just amazing. Same with NPCs. They're closer to a sprite-based game like Daggerfall than Kingsfield, which honestly I prefer. They look amazing, and as do their animations. Everything has a clear vision to its design and movesets. You can actually make out the movements in this game, which is absolutely imperative in a first-person game like this, as well as one of the more pixelated enemies. While I love Daggerfall, I could never make out what the hell they were doing whenever they were moving in their fight animations. There's also just inspiration to these monsters. The hopping, knife-throwing goatmen aren't quite like anything I've ever seen before. The Fae and the Pixies in the Labyrinth are suitably beautiful, but surrealist and terrible. Terrifying. The audio design for everything is perfect too. One of my favorite examples is when you reach the floor of the shopkeeper, the loading screen you can hear the entire floor of enemies get killed. When you load in, everything is eerily quiet. The enemies are all already masses of gore in the ground, doors already opened, and slowly you'll walk in the darkness and find the shopkeeper. In general, the presentation audio is outstanding, with a few exceptions. The water narrates sound more like trolls and water spirits, one of the few things I can think of that is not good. The dungeons and environments all look fantastic. Though there are only 10 tile set, you will be seeing them a lot. The randomized nature of the dungeons make it hard to get tired of seeing them. And again, the small details. Be it ritualistic paintings and blood made by the goatmen, or, or hanging skeletons that you can search in the torture dungeon, or all the traps and interactable objects. Potions and spells aren't your only healing either. Spawning moss, puddles, bubbles, wells, and other things in the environment can lead to a risk reward of healing and or damage and or infliction. The mushrooms especially tend to have very good healing, but make your screen weird and invert your controls for a bit. Hidden doors are also on every floor, as they should be, and I love them, though it does end up leading to a lot of wall hugging. <laughs> 
The game has tons of achievements, 111 in total, whereas Bilbo Baggins would say 111, which is actually super fun to aspire to, and I think helps combat the bitter failure that some roguelikes with permadeath can make you feel. Just take a look and see how many things that you've accomplished in the game, and also how many more you can look forward to completing. And it just also shows you how much content there is in this huge game that can be easily mistaken for small at first glance. For negatives in the presentation and small details, I only have a few complaints. The game is less about fidelity, as it's heavily stylized, and there are no glaring issues with that style, and it's more about if the design clicks with you, and it clicked with me very much so, I tend to be very smartly designed with a player's ease of control prioritized. Lots of options for FOV and graphics help with that too. I think a couple more dungeon zones being allowed with the first floor would be great, and I think that there could be more to see or do in the village, and perhaps a way to barter and sell your items more easily. But otherwise, I think that this game is honestly just very solid for what it is. I think it's no secret that Devil's Fire is a fantastic game, at least in my opinion, for newcomers of the genre and old timers alike. It's the most approachable yet simultaneously intense dungeon crawler I've ever played, where I was always looking forward to the next floor, or the next character, or the next item. The potential is infinite, and I heavily look forward to what these developers may do in the future, as this isn't just a great template, but already a great game. Imagine what a sequel could entail, or a spiritual successor. I recommend it, completely. It should genuinely be a case study on how to make a content-rich but approachable game from scratch. I will also say, for those who are on the fence. The game does have a free demo if you want to try it before you buy. Though the game is only $9.99 USD, which is an insanely low price tag the amount of content you're getting. Genuinely dozens, if not hundreds of hours. This is the end of the review section of the video. For those who just wanted to hear my opinions and make your own, thank you for watching. But, if you want to stick around, I'm going to recount and make a narrative of my favorite character, one who I played earlier in my playthrough as a Devil's Spire. I want to recount his adventure to demonstrate the game's dynamic storytelling and role-playing potential. This is the tale of a cat's son. Chesh had entered these lands in exile. As most do, as a renegade and deserter, he spent his life always on the run and on the wrong side of the law. He felt he was always conditioned to be a rebel. He's actually named after his father, a feigned but mischievous philosopher. He didn't know his dad much, and he claimed that Chesh II was similar, if albeit less scattered in the brain, and thus less brilliant. But Chesh nobly kept his father's devious ways, and when he found a chance to slip away from the army, he did, and rather quickly. Chesh was a survivor and Chesh really, really didn't want to die in some war he didn't care about. As he roamed the wilderness one night, his food long gone, a small sack of coins by his side, he moved past the devastation of the war and plague, and he came upon a small village through a dense forest at the foot of a massive tower. One he learned was famed, in fact, and one he had heard of, the Devil Spire, the tower of both death and misfortune, but also riches and redemption. He sought no redemption. He was sure of himself, he always had been. He did not believe he had salvation to seek. The only salvation he ever would entertain was one internally. The war meant nothing to him. And though the plagues were indeed sad, they were not concerning to him, as they were not caused by him. Chesh concerned Chesh. There was no fortune to be had in these hard times, save those that you could take, like the fortune within the Devil's Spire. As he entered the village, he decided that he would be as kind to these people as he could. After all, I betrayed those who could aid you otherwise. They weren't the soldiers who took him. They weren't the plague materialized. They were just people. If albeit strange ones. He bought some lantern oil and throwing knives with what little coin he had left before entering the tower. His military outfit of rusted armor and a bone baton shield did not suit him at all. As he left, some of the villagers wished him good luck, but even more dismissed him outright, rather quickly, with the bitter farewells that followed after him. In all their eyes, though, he saw, and he knew, they rarely, if ever, met anyone again who passed through those doors. Chesh believed in lucky rituals. Back home, he would always make sure that he rubbed iron if he had a negative thought or knocked on wood. And right before he was about to part the doors, he doubled back and rang the bell for some good fortune, feeling more awake and invigorated as well as protected as he entered the tower. To say the first floor was frightening to Chesh would be an understatement. As soon as he entered the massive structure, he could see at the edge of his lamplight many goat-faced creatures standing in the muck. As he hurriedly brought in his breath, trying to stabilize it, he made a brave face, as he always did when he was about to do something risky, and with narrowed eyes and gathered posture, he began slowly closing in, his large shield raised and knives thrown at the goatmen. He was so fast at throwing these knives, and so careful with his footfalls, he was able to kill the first few without a single bit of harm being brought to himself. But as more became aware, he got a few wounds from the goatman's knives and spells. And though he blocked most of the thrown projectiles, he could interrupt his spells with kicks and thrusts. He couldn't block them all. But in the end, he was able to beat them to death. The baton felt unwieldy in his hands. He knew other scoundrels and thieves liked to use them to avoid lethality. But lethality is what he needed now. 
as he slammed it deep into their skulls, interrupting their throwing and spell casting. As the last one stood out, Chesh switched to dueling the baton in his right hand and throwing knives in the left, which suited him better. Why rely on defense when you can be so fast you can't be hit? He continued up the floors, taking a few scrapes but mostly dealing more damage than he got. He healed with the little sustenance he could find in the spire, and found more loot as he scavenged too. Some lockpicks, armor, rusty weapons, and broken tools. But the most important one was only on the second floor, an enchanted ring. When he read the runic engravings that described what it did, his eyes immediately grew in excitement. It was a vortex ring. Any attack he made now would send a ranged vortex after his initial swing. This would suit him perfectly. He already prioritized ranged attacks and being quick after all, so he kissed it and put it on account of his blessings. As he ascended further, this vortex ring made him near unstoppable. Because of this, he would make sure he cleared every room and piece of loot he could before ascending. He would become rich off of this. He knew it. He would survive. As he reached the massive monster in this part of the spire, he ran along the edges of its domain, and sent the vortexes out with his baton, eventually switching back to his trusty throwing knives. And he realized now, they actually doubled up due to the vortex ring, and quickly he vanquished the beast. One he had known killed many before him. When this creature fell, its mass turned into flat ooze on the ground. He felt a power grow within him, brought from this giant slime into himself. A literal growth. The acidic wounds healed over, and he felt better. Faster, stronger, he knew he would win this. As he reached the next floor, he could hear as he climbed the sounds of battle. But it wasn't a battle. Chesh had heard massacres before, and this was one. He could hear as a dozen creatures cried out, and then became lesser gurgling whispers as they reached the floor. It was eerily silent. The doors were open, enemies turned into bloody pulps, though surprisingly, some of the loot was not taken. He scavenged the chests and found lamp oil in an empty bottle, but not much else. And just as he reached the stairs up, he finally saw him, or rather saw it, the shopkeeper, staying just across from the stairs up with various items laid about, with cars to tell the price and what they were. This robed thing must have been what killed the entire floor. But as Chesh sized up the shopkeeper, it was just a thin frame within a robe. Could it truly be this powerful? As he perused the wares, he found most of the prices still beyond anything he could afford. And the shopkeeper would not respond to his offers of selling or trade. Chesh was a bargainer at heart, and he was also fairly gregarious. He could not get on without speaking to people, and this thing's lack of response annoyed him, unnerved him. Chesh could stand many things, but being ignored when he wished to be seen was not one of them. Chesh bought the cheapest item, some van braces for an unarmored part of his body, and as he went to take the stairs up, he paused. The shopkeeper really upset him. The prices were outrageous, and it wouldn't speak to him. He really wanted to speak. So he made a decision. The kind Chesh was known for. High-risk ones. He picked up a barrel from the stairs and turned back to the shopkeeper. He could really use these items. Chesh was not a murderer, but he would try to intimidate the shopkeeper, or shake it down, swipe some items and run, or even just get it to speak to him. He craved actual words, those he had not heard but from himself since the village. So he rolled the barrel towards the shopkeeper, very roughly, and sarcastically asked for a price on it, as the wood shattered against its frame. Briefly, red eyes flashed with the impact, but it stood still, saying nothing. Chesh approached, and still it did nothing. And so, as Chesh asked him how much splinters would get him, he hit the shopkeeper on the shoulder with a baton, commanding him to speak. Chesh, while not a murderer, was a bully, and this shopkeeper was making him rather angry. In response to the baton, the shopkeeper took an arm out of his robe and threw daggers at Chesh faster than he could ever hope to compete against. One dagger quickly entered him, straight into his side, an inch away from being lethal. He dodged and ran, and another dagger stuck into him. He was nearing death. He knew he was, and as he ran to hide in a corner, he screamed for a truce, trying to explain to the shopkeeper that his silence and prices unnerved him. He just wanted to talk with all he wanted, words. But the shopkeeper turned a corner. It stabbed him in the arm again. Chesh was the closest to death he had ever been. On a scale of 1 to 110, he was literally at a 1. And as he ran like an animal, blood seeping from several deep wounds, he reached the top of the stairs and slammed the trapdoor closed below him. He was alive. Barely. He would live. He would survive. But for how long? As he transitioned from the humid and overgrown ruins to, surprisingly, a sandy place, dry and hot. Very hot, with sandstone walls and streams of sand leaking from places in the ceiling. He could hear creatures moaning in the distance. Two he could barely make out. They looked like a genie, and the other a mummy. Chesh had heard of these creatures, even seen them advertised as oddities at a traveling carnival back home. But he never cared to actually look at them. He wished he had now. Perhaps there's a weakness in them to exploit. He stood still. He tried to gather any knowledge he knew. 
He knew that quote-unquote wise men would sell mummy wrappings for good luck, and that genies liked bargains. But speaking had gotten him nowhere. He was in no strong position to debate, or argue terms, and he doubted the genie would even listen to them. He continued standing still, or as still as one could be, as he thought to himself. He could not return below. The shopkeeper would have him killed. And besides, he checked, and the trap door was locked. He literally could not return below. But also, he could not recover without action, for he had nothing to heal with. Either he stood still and died, either his wounds by dehydration, or he continued on, and died to a creature. Or maybe, just maybe, he would survive. The chance was low. He felt even a stone thrown at him would end his life now, and he was right. But he couldn't just not act. That was not Chesh. He swayed as he, as he continued forward and stumbled into the side of the wall, and found a door. Passageway beyond it, heading towards the direction of the genie. At the end of the hallway, another mummy emerged. Just at the edge of his sight, Chesh drew his trusty throwing knives, a purchase that appeared to be very worthwhile, and tossed them at the mummy. The first throw was too short, but he rushed forward. If this was to be the end, he would go out with teeth bared, and having tried just to try, he threw again, both hitting the creature, who on closer glance did not appear to be a mummy at all, but instead a strange flesh golem of some kind. Still, he threw, and it fell dead, his knives sticking out of it. He had survived. He really had. And he would keep surviving. He rushed forward, past a door hidden behind falling sand and met the genie face to face, and killed it with two throws, making four daggers in his chest. He would survive. He hobbled forward. He found it hard to be speedy with his many wounds. He needed to be calm and withdrawn. He began slowly looking for anything to eat or drink, knowing as a coin flip chance it may harm him. He came upon an urn with sandy water, drank it, and found it disgusting and froze him for a second. But it didn't harm him beyond just being foul. But neither did it heal him. He found some bristled plants that he shoved in his mouth. At first they stung a little, but quickly they began to soothe his pain. Not by much, but by some. Behind the plant, though, he could feel a draft, and the wall felt weak. He pushed it and it collapsed downwards. Behind it, a chest, and within it, a healing potion. He drank it right away, and every single one of his wounds was magically mended, the flesh tying itself back together. Whatever god there was, was with him. He felt it. He got excited. He laughed and jumped with his refound power and health. He continued, vigor and hope within him again. He killed many strange creatures and found more loot, notably a nice short sword that with the vortex made a wide sweep and a crossbow that, like the throwing knife, shot two projectiles now, but was nobly weaker than the knives. He even found some strange items, like a cursed doll, as well as an amulet of willpower for mages. Though he knew no spells, he still put it on, and swore he would sell it once he was out for a pretty penny, or maybe even learn some witchcraft. Chesh reached the top of this complex, and found a strange, blocky head that could move, like a sentient statue. Though honestly, Chesh felt so powerful now the vortexes of his sword, he figured he would kill it rather quickly as he had the slime. Even as it used strange spells that seemed to break reality and summon enemies, he would vanquish it. He'd dodged around the edges of the room, and swung vortexes at it, and it spawned, reducing them to meaty piles on the floor. He moved in closer, but was hit with a spell, an adamantine beacon that hit him square in the chest, bringing him back to that one out of 110. He thought quickly to what was on him, but he didn't have anything else to heal himself. He dodged it once more, continued on, getting closer, and as he threw another vortex, trying to kill the creature, another spell hit him like lightning, and Chesh fell. He wanted to survive. He told himself he would survive. He really, really hoped he wouldn't die. And he really, really hoped he wouldn't die. Thank you for watching. I've actually played around 30 ish different characters in Devil's Spire now, but Chesh was the one who stuck with me the most, even if he didn't last that long. I've always been fond of the Cheshire Cat's design. And when I made a feline character a few hours into the game, the name came to me and stuck. I made the story up on the spot, using the descriptions in the game, the events, and a little bit of imagination. I had many other characters too, and I will name them, just for posterity's sake so they can be remembered, as I kind of miss them. But I jawed them down on my notes. Emery the Despot, a noble bastard who abused his authority too much and fled like Chesh into the wilds. Then there was Ivan, a barbarian who got pretty far into the game, actually, swinging his big axe and using a cursed item he found that healed all of his HP for the cost of his mana. Since he didn't believe in using magic, 
that suited him pretty well. Not as far as the Fae's labyrinth, but they got lost and turning around was killed by the magics of a pixie that he didn't believe in, hitting him and paralyzing him with massive damage. Vlad was a nefarious dark wizard, and Chesh the First came looking for his son. There's just so many more. This is a great game, and role players should rejoice when playing it. I already mentioned it, but the sheer variety of weapons, locales, and playstyles just make it a genuinely infinite game. The roguelike nature of it suits the Kingsfield formula just perfectly. I will reiterate and just outright say it. Get this game if it interests you. It actually was also strangely personal to me, as my first massive D&D campaign I ever DM'd to my teens was based around a similar concept in Devil's Spire. A massive dungeon that every door opened takes you to a random impossible environment. And this was basically that went to a game form, which was great fun, and like in a way, my old game being in a video game. <laughs> there of course were differences, but it was still fairly close. If you liked the video, like it. And comment as well, please. I really enjoy hearing what people think of my videos and stories. And if you want to stick around and subscribe, please do so. I also have a Patreon if that interests you. And if the developers are watching this video, thank you for making such a great game. This is your Resident Eccentric, and I will see you again. Farewell.